live here. So, live from you, from YouTube and Facebook, uh, this is the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society Science Chat. I am your uh, moderator and host, Franklin Hu. And uh, today uh, we have uh, a topic on the fine structure constant from James Keene. So, uh, James, I'm going to let you uh, take it away from here. So. Okay, just in our Wikipedia article, we have a defined structure constant, alpha, is, a fun, is thought to be a fundamental physical constant characterizing the strength of the electromagnetic interaction between charged particles, elementary charged particles such as electrons. Now, by the strength, sometimes this is called the coupling constant between photons and electrons or uh, the relative strength of the electromagnetic force compared to other forces. Now, uh, if we look at this part of the Feynman diagram, we can look at the, uh, think of the electromagnetic forces as a photon as shown here, and here an electron. And you notice the point of interaction, this vertex in the old fashioned Feynman diagram that we have here is where the interaction takes place and supposedly the fine structure constant is the probability that such an interaction will take place. Notice that in the Feynman diagrams, as I've said previously elsewhere, the vertices, most of the physics is occurring here. It's completely a black box right here, okay? Now let's go to my slide. Let's see, I, I bring this up and well, start slide. Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I always thought the, the constant that describes the, uh, the strength of the force between charges is like uh, the, the Coulomb's law constant. Is, is this different from that? Uh, how is th this different than well, the... Well, that, that is a very good question. Let's defer that until after my presentation, because I don't think I have a stock answer for that. <laughs> okay, but well, uh, you're saying something that, about, literally... about this, yes, this no, number. Go ahead, Frank. You're saying something about this particular value has something about the uh, probability that some interaction will occur. Exactly, and well, uh, apparently the uh, the Coulomb's law takes all of this into account and it is enshrined within the Coulomb constant. I guess that's my best shot. Uh, perhaps others here will have another shot at that same question, but Franklin, that's an excellent question and point of view to, to bring up at this juncture. So, I would think that the chance of interaction would be like 100% all the time. Is it? Is it not 100%? Well, no, not, well, well, that's not the, uh, the uh, uh, conventional view among physicists, th that alpha is the probability of an interaction between a, a photon and an electron. Okay, well, and by the way. If I have two electrons uh -huh. next to each other, and if they're communicating by photons, once again, I would think that uh, the chance of them communicating is 100%. I'm just wondering, is this summer field constant? Is that like a percentage? Uh, uh, well, at the elementary particle level of the photon and the electron, the single photon and electron, the uh, alpha, yes, it's a percentage, as I'm going to get into in just a moment. The, uh, um, it's, it's, you know, like if we scroll down in this fine structure constant uh, article, we'll see that the great physicist uh, Feynman, uh, who, who wrote the famous Feynman lecture series in physics, uh, calls alpha one of the most mysterious constants in physics of why alpha has the value that it does have, okay? So I guess my best shot at answering the relationship between alpha and the Coulomb's law is that hidden in the, uh, or within the Coulomb constant, this probability is taken into account. Okay, so is that good and I can proceed for the moment? By the way, could, could I just uh, pop in there? You, you said something about its value. Um, 
I think there's some question about the value because I think Eddington said, you know, you can try to uh, establish what its value is um, experimentally, but there is an argument that it has the value of 100, 1 over 137 exactly. Do you have any view on right. that, James? Okay. If we scroll down in this Wikipedia article, thank, thank you for the comment, Ian. We're going to see that there's a long history of all kinds of mathematical and numerical attempts to determine why alpha has the value that it does. The reciprocal of alpha is, is approximately 137, uh, according to um, the Na National Institute of Standards, uh, NIST.gov. Uh, the current value of alpha is about uh, reciprocal of alpha is uh, 137 point something, point one something. And uh, the actual probability is point uh, zero zero seven two nine approximately. But yes, Ian, you're exactly right that many physicists have, have, have speculated, is alpha really a constant over time? Like for example, in earlier times in the universe, did alpha have a slightly different value perhaps? Or um, many, many attempts to determine mathematically some formula or series, for example, uh, the mathematicians like these C series full formulas, you know, like where, where you add, add up one thing, then the next thing, then the next thing in, in a series. And But no one has been able to get to the uh, approximate measured value of alpha. Now, perhaps there'll be more questions if I go on and give you my approach, my new approach. Well, I see Charlie, uh, Bill Lucas is saying that alpha is the result of some other constants, E2 well, over AC. Yeah, if, if we scroll down in this article, you're going to see that alpha is not necessarily independent of other so-called physical constants. And uh, uh, so uh, Dr. Lucas is, is exactly correct. These are not independent values. Uh, and uh, in fact, these fundamental constants like electric charge, speed of light, etc., are all, uh, in my opinion, as I've stated previously, uh, unexplained data, perhaps the greatest body of unexplained data and observations in physics, why these uh, parameters have the values that they have. Um, now, there, uh, I will welcome more comments as we go along, but I, but uh, this is actually not even my first slide yet. Well, I think it's important to understand what the fine structure. But and before letting you go on, I wanted to know if you had any comments on why is this called the fine structure? Because this doesn't seem to have to do with anything. Okay. About uh, uh, apparently, it also relates to the distance between <coughs> certain emission and or absorption bands. Like for example, there's the Balmer bands, B-A-L-M-E-R bands and the Lyman bands, L-Y-M-A-N and so forth. And, and that's why it originally got the term fine structure because those um, uh, spectral peaks, if you will, or troughs in the case of absorption bands um, were uh, characterized uh, under the heading fine structure. So yes, the alpha has been related to that. If we scroll down in this very article I'm showing on the screen now, you'll see that there are multiple formulas expressing alpha in terms of other physical constants. So it's obviously just for the mathematicians among us, uh, uh, it's, it's not an independent parameter by any means at all. Okay, shall we go but to the first? Huh? How do they measure this experimentally? How do they measure it experimentally? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that to, for another slide, I guess. I, I don't think I have a slide on that. Okay, are we ready to go? Let, 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 let's go to the first slide here. Okay, slide show. Okay, can, can we see this? The physical constants derivation tree. Now, as many here may know, I have defined primary constants 
for energy expressed in kilograms, or in other words, mass, length, and time, which are the units of measurement in physics. But in order to account for rest mass, uh, Planck's constant, electric charge, fractional charge, light speed, intrinsic electron magnetic moment, uh, and of course, the, uh, the related to Planck's constant, of course, is the intrinsic electron and proton spin shown here. <coughs> For some of these, as you can see, we have to throw in alpha to get the values. So do we have only three primary constants which can explain or account for all of the so-called fundamental constants of physics, which again, I characterize as unexplained observations, at least unto, at least up to this physical constants der derivation tree was constructed? Or do we have four? Do we have to have alpha in there? Is it really fundamental? What exactly is alpha? So there's a little introduction there. Now let's look at the latest version, which by the way is available for download, version 2.7.3 uh, of the Binary Mechanics Lab simulator. This is a simulation of dimension of 80 spots. In other words, there's approximately, there's over half a million spots in this uh, simulated volume, okay? Now, here's the spectrum over here, which shows a peak, by the way. Uh, and the, the, this peak down here, if you can see, it may be rather small, uh, 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 occurs at tick, uh, 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 an interval of ticks 1161. And one can calculate the wavelength of this peak in the spectrum, by the way. Now, the new thing that I want to show you is just to zoom in on what the, the last slide was, was I've added alpha. If alpha is the probability that a uh, electromagnetic event occurs, here is the formula. What is S and V? S, in, S is your scalar events in the scalar bit operation. And V is your vector or magnetic events in the vector bit operation. The sum of those I call Ke right, right here. So that's your uh, events. Now, what is the probability of those events? Well, what is affected by the, the, these events accelerate an M-type bit. You see the M-type bits are counted up here with the little M that I'm trying to highlight with my red pointer here. Now, uh, so that if we divide the number of vector and scalar, or in other words, electromagnetic events occurring by the number of um, quanta of the M type, remember there's two types, the L type and the M type, but the number of quanta of the M type, which have the charge attribute, we're going to get alpha. Okay, now if you run this, so in other words, I'm saying that alpha is no more, that, it, that alpha is exactly what physicists have been saying it is. The probability that an electromagnetic event would occur for each particular M-type quanta in a volume. So you just simply do this division here and you get this value. Now, this value is a running average of about 50 in what we call in computer uh, programming a ring buffer, okay? The same way as the mass ratio. Now, the interesting thing is that if you run this for a period of time, you're going to see that these values, both for the proton-electron mass ratio and for alpha, they sort of oscillate up and down. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, here is the uh, spot cube uh, model of space, where space consists of, is thought to consist of a lattice of spot cubes. Notice that within the spot cube, you have juxtaposed an arrow or L-type bit with the M-type bits, which are shown by the circles. In other words, this is a magnetic effect. A magne this bit, if one, or if a quanta is in this location, 
uh, acts as a magnetic potential effect accelerating this M bit to the L bit position in this uh, uh, spot unit. This little rectangular thing box here is called a spot unit. And there are three spot units in each spot, as you can see. Next slide. Now, here to summarize what I just showed you, I was showing you the vector force where you have an M bit juxtaposed with uh, an L type bit, which can result in, in an acceleration of the M bit uh, to the next uh, location within the spot unit, which would be from here to here. Oh, okay, that's your magnetic force. And as I just said, <coughs> this, <coughs> excuse me, this occurs only within spot cubes. Uh, and and countercurrent spot units. Countercurrent just means they're pointing in opposite directions. You see how they're pointing in opposite directions here. Oh, okay. Now the scalar force is where you have concurrent spot units. In, in other words, an adjacent pair pointing in the same direction here or here, and that will also. And here's your Coulomb force now which we derived, uh, by the way, the uh, used to derive the electric charge in the scalar bit operation shown here, where this is going to accelerate an M-type bit to the L position, thereby separating charge. Okay, now, these things vary. So what is all, uh, in other words, the value of this probability Shown here, the probability for these events to occur, according to the Binary Mechanics Lab simulator anyway, uh, does vary. If you run this, you're going to see it's going up and down and up and down. And it tends to be associated with a certain density. Here we have this small d is the density or probability that any bit locus will have a quanta in it. And it's here we have point. Uh, 242. In, in other words, approximately one quarter of the bit loci uh, have quanta, in other words, one state bits in them. Okay, so uh, and so alpha depends upon bit density. So if the whole model I'm presenting to you right now uh, makes any sense at all, it means that these measure the measurements of alpha that have been taking place in laboratories and uh, uh Fra franklin uh, did raise the question of, of what exactly are the methods that are used uh must be occurring at a bit density determined by these simulations of about 0.24 last slide so we said that the alpha value does vary if you run the BMLS simulator um, for a long time, okay? M many thousands of BMLS ticks. How many BMLS ticks is in an attosecond? An attosecond is reportedly the greatest time resolution level achieved thus far by experimentalists according to, I say reportedly, according to various things I, I've read. They're, they're about at the attosecond level of ability <coughs> to resolve and measure time. Well, an attosecond is about 10 to the minus 18 seconds. One BMLS tick in which the time evolution laws are applied, which are the four bit operations, is 4T, <coughs> where T is the primary time constant, okay, which I showed you in the very first slide. Uh, okay, so 4T is this, is about 2.8 to the minus 24 seconds. In other words, here's the punchline, one attosecond about the finest level of time resolution possible in experimental physics today is equal to approximately 3.5 million BMLS ticks, 3.5 million. So in other words, I'm running some runs here in, in what I showed you where I have 6,000 ticks. Now, what we need is some uh, math guys that are good at um, uh, numerical analysis. Uh, because one could say, how much variation can you have in the fine structure constant 
as shown here if you download the latest version of the binary mechanics lab simulator how many uh, how much variation in this can occur where uh, o over th millions and millions of such ticks it would appear to be a constant to experimentalists so that's sort of the end of my presentation <clears throat> in a way i've raised a lot of questions but it's a whole new approach what i did here with the alpha is simply say let's take what the physicists are saying the particle physicists are saying literally that alpha is the probability and if we scroll down in that wikipedia article you're going to see the great physicist richard feynman saying that exactly that that alpha is the probability of an interaction between a photon and an electron okay well those interactions are in binary mechanics represented by the sum of these uh, two events where these events occur when the bit operations are applied divided by the number of possible candidates that's the small m which is this number up here and you can get out a calculator uh ju just divide 2744 by 370,000 such and such and you should get alpha right there now <clears throat> Alpha depends upon bit density. So in other words, what we're saying is wherever alpha is is measured to be approximately what is shown uh, here, it's at, it's actually uh, 00, 0, 0, 0, 7, 2, 9 and some additional digits. But if you notice at NIST.government, alpha is one of the least accurately measured constants so-called fundamental constants so if we go back to my very first slide <coughs> we're now saying this is not a fundamental constant anymore folks it just comes right uh, directly from the energy space-time quantization in in uh, um, in binary mechanics so now we're down to just three fundamental constants explaining all the others a end of story I'll leave the slides up in case there's some discussion uh, of, that refers to them, so I don't have to go back and put them back back up again. So your uh, the the fine structure constant is actually not really a constant; it's an average, and that's why it's not really known that well, right? That's your uh, that uh, yes, I I I, I I'd have to say yes to that. Uh, looks like Lucera's got a question. He's asking, is the electric charge a constant as well? Or perhaps not. Well, I, I have a whole other paper on the derivation of uh, uh, a el el elementary charge. I think the title of it is el Elementary Charge Derivation on the Journal of Binary Mechanics. But is it a constant? <coughs> is it constant? Apparently, well, apparently I think so. he possibly is asking, um, is it constant uh, with respect to speed as well? I mean, if you have a, a relative speed between the uh, an observer and, and a charge, uh, would the charge be constant? Well, that's a good question. Uh, that's why I'm presenting this in this forum, because there's bright minds here that can take these. And rather than just posing the question, answer it provide the answer see what i'm doing is providing a ten tentative answer so join me so uh-huh sorry I'm, I'm just saying that um obviously a lot more work needs to be done on this but since you've posed the question to me uh my provisional uh, position is that charge is invariant yes if that's an answer to Masser and, and uh, an answer to you for the moment. <clears throat> and I have no reason in my work to, to dispute that. If you look at the formulas here. Oh, okay. Here's elementary charge is three, the fractional charge. And these are, oh, okay. These values here are all written in stone. You notice that Coulomb's constant is here. That's the K sub naught. 
So I would agree with what Ian just said that elementary charge appears to be an invariable and in, in, you know, the whole idea of even calling these three values primary constants in physics is that they don't vary, they're invariant. If they're var varying, well, then they're not constants at all, they're misnamed. And these are all very small uh, quantities. So I would interpret that as say being the smallest quantity of time or the smallest quantity of blanks. Exactly. So well, whenever we measure any of these things, we should get some multiple of these constants. In general, yes. Like, let's go ahead here. The length constant is the this side, this length here. Can you see the little red cursor from here to here? That's your length constant L. It's about 0.67 or two thirds of a femto femtometer. Can hardly say it. Femtometer. <coughs> By the way, scattering day data in major accelerator labs show that the radius of the proton and nucleon is approximately 1.3 femtometers. Okay, so that agrees with the spot cube being approximately the uh, uh, equivalent to uh, where you're going to find and size out an, a, a, a nucleon. Uh, okay, you can look at this as where a nucleon might, might exist. And if it had an electron in the nucleon, then that nucleon would be called a neutron and not a proton. Okay, so that's interesting. You're saying the measured size of the proton is about the same size as your whole spot, you know, this, basically that's your element of space, right? Exactly, and that's how I deduced what the, the length constant was from that experimental data. So like if the ra radius is approximately 1.3, let, let's take here, this is not from the center of the spot cube, but let's take halfway from here, if you can see my red cursor to the edge here, well, that's two length constants. Well, uh, if 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 this is about 1.3 femtometers, then it must be that uh, one length constant is about a, two thirds of a femtometer, and that's what I'm finding out. Okay. So, in other words, this model of space agrees with proton scattering data. Incidentally, that data also shows that the proton is not spherical that they're little things sticking out, okay? <clears throat> and if you look at the the uh, proton uh, bit cycle that I showed, I guess last week or recently anyway, with regard to the inertial propulsion mechanism, uh, the <clears throat> it's obviously not entirely circular, okay? And what I need is someone to plug in the coordinates of those bit loci into a CAD program and show me a rotating proton so that the world can see for the first time with the magic of CAD programming of the shape of the proton. Well, do you, do you, well, I just imagine the shape of the proton is, is just like your diagram there, or are you talking about the Well, yeah, it's the diagram of, of, of the proton bit cycle, which uh, given my graphic abilities is not all that great. You know, that I showed with the inertial propulsion article that we discussed, I guess, last week. And uh, so, um, yes, I admit my graphic abilities are not all that great. What I would love to see is all those coordinates, which are right there in that figure from uh, that inertial propulsion mechanism article. And it's in the article there uh, on, on the website. Uh, as well as in the video from last week right here on uh, C CPNS. Um, <clears throat> put that in a CAD pro program and let's see it rotate and spin around. So because it's showing that what independent investigators have determined that the proton is not spherical, that's what binary mechanics says. It's not spherical. In, in other words, these accelerator labs, I consider them as sort of I'm outsourcing some of the day data collection. Let, let them collect the data and, and show that everything the binary mechanics say says is correct. So far, I've found no data of any sort whatsoever 
to contradict a any uh, assertion that binary mechanics has made up to now. And that's what you call a good physical theory. That's I mean, what, you what this uh, data looks like, uh, how are they determining that it's non-spherical? Normally, the, they just- I think uh, I cite the paper, and it, in my paper is, is, is titled Non-Spherical Proton Shape. In there, I cite the article, uh, at least one of the articles that, uh, that assert this from an independent lab, this is not my work, and, and I'm sure they present their methods in great de detail there. And one can lo look at it, you know, if, 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 if you're a real aficionado of accelerator uh, <clears throat> uh, scattering type of uh, research. I see some article like non sphere with a proton shape and hydrogen hyperfine splitting. Well, I'm still curious on how they actually experimentally measure even the fine structure constant. Did they mention that here in this article? Well, we can go to, uh, let's see, how do I stop the? I don't want to stop sharing. I want to stop because the slide. It seems, it seems that the fine structure constant is like, De derivable from all these other constants. So, well, if we scroll down in the Wikipedia article, I'm trying to get my slideshow off the screen here without actually leaving the session or whatever. Let's see. Uh, uh, I'm not aware yeah, yeah. Of that, the value that I and, mentioned. Oh, earlier. and and show. Okay, and show. Now, now we can go go back here. Let's scroll scroll down. You notice, uh, Frank Franklin. I've magnified the the, the article so that it appears in big print. Here yeah, are all good. the formulas of equivalencies of, of, of alpha, which shows that it's not an independent qu qu quantity. Measurement, this is what you want. The recommended value is such and such as a blank screen there. Oh, there it is. There is the value. See, point zero zero seven two nine, as I said, and some additional digits. And so this, what's the this value subsection is the measurement. Screen? Yeah, yeah. Like if we go back to the slideshow, uh, look, let, let's see. Uh, how do I do that? I click well, that here. Part, uh, that point zero zero seven. It's a like really small number, right? Yeah, right here. You see this number here? Exactly. It should say seven two nine down here in the right lower right hand corner. Oh, okay. For the exact value that we had in. Uh, uh, in the Wikipedia article uh, and show back to the Wikipedia here. Uh, this is the inverse of it. And let's see there, you see? 007297 or approximately uh, 0073, okay? Now, uh, this section here is supposedly how they measure it. The measurement out of out has a relative uncertainty, the value of the uncertainty. I, I guess you might have, whoops, I guess you're going to have to go read the references for for the measurements, okay, okay of, of exactly what was done. Be, because the section is titled measurement, <laughs> you know, but uh, the actual experiments are not laid out as in a physics class. Uh, I, 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 I guess you actually have to, you know, uh, you know, get, you know, do do some calisthenics and get it get in shape and and read some of these references to get the methods on exactly what experimentalists are 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 doing. Okay, uh, down here, unless they've taken it out of the article, is Feynman. Down here, a little more. Come on, where's Feynman? You can see this is a long, long article. This is a long hi history. If my approach to alpha is correct, it it's it's like a major event in fed physics. I mean, you 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 see all the effort that has been put into numerological explanations of of alpha and so forth. All of this, if my approach that uh, I'm presenting for the first time to uh, planet planet Earth to today is is, is correct, mm -hmm. all of this is out the window. Oh, okay, uh, Feynman. 
The most profound and beautiful question associated with the observed coupling constant, E, the amplitude for a real electron to emit or absorb a real photon. It is a simple number that has been experimentally determined to be close to 0 0.85. My physicist friends won't recognize this number because they like to remember it is the inverse of its square. This is Feynman speaking here about 137. In other words, if you invert this number here, you get the 0 0.00729 value that uh, I've been talking about and showing you. Okay, nobody knows. It's one of the greatest damn mysteries in physics, a magic number that comes to us with no understanding by man. You might say the hand of God wrote that number, and we don't know how he pushed his pencil. We know what kind of a dance to do experimentally to measure this number very accurately, which is what uh, Franklin has been asking about. I guess we have to read the articles as to what the dance is to, to measure it experimentally is, you know, what, what kind of gadgets that people set, set up in the lab to, to measure it. But we don't know what kind of dance to do on the computer to make this number come out without putting it in secretly. Now, in this, Richard Fine, now, uh, what Dr. Feynman has just said here is ba basically saying what I'm now saying is that this number is in fact the probability, in fact, taken literally for an electromagnetic interaction with a charged particle, a charged M-type uh, qu quanta in binary mechanics. And that is associated with a certain overall quanta density. And it must be that in these laboratories, this is, in fact, I am now speculating, the, the quanta density that one finds in these laboratories at approximately standard pressure temperature at, you know, at near sea, sea level of what we have on the surface of the Earth. That's what I'm saying. So who set the quanta density in that particular simulation you had there? I just wanted to make sure you didn't set that specifically ooh, ooh, ooh. to hit that alpha. Oh, okay. If if we if we start the binary mechanics lab simulator just with all the defaults, it starts out with about a 0.24 density. Now, if you're running in rand mode, which means that any quanta exiting the simulated volume are replaced randomly on the six sides of the simulated space with incoming quanta. To <coughs> so if we, we lose some, co so this is, the idea here is that imagine the simulated volume is immersed in a larger volume of approximately the same density. So that outgoing radiation indicates, uh, uh, excuse me, approximately equals incoming radiation and therefore, in terms of quant quanta leaving or entering the simulated volume, and uh, this is chosen by, uh, you can cho choose it at the beginning of the program, or if you're running in RAND mode, you see RND here, and it's probably awfully small, but in the upper right where I have my cursor, the red dot cursor, it says RND for RAND. If you're running in that mode, you can hit the plus and minus keys to adjust that. And you can fiddle with it. And I started to fiddle with it at first, thinking that there must be a density where I'm going to get exactly alpha. And so I, I would say, whoops, alpha is a little bit too low, so let's increase the density a little bit. Or it's a little bit too high, let's decrease by hitting the minus key, the density a, a little bit. And what I found, looking at the screen, hundreds and thousands of BMLS ticks, is that it sort of wanders around. So if you average tens of thousands of ticks, you're going to get a certain value related to a particular density. And all of this is research yet to be done. Anyone listening now can download the simulator and do that research and report it to get the exact density uh, or, or even to chart the, uh, the density shown here, the target density shown here, D equals, okay? with the uh, uh, ring buffer uh, average of alpha uh, as 
computed here, and as I had explained, and 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 interpolate actually to the exact density. And I'm the only thing that would make this consistent, I think, unless I'm just terribly mistaken, and probably it could well be I am terribly mistaken, but that this density must be the density of our labs at approximately standard pressure, temperature around sea level, uh, uh, whatever. And so it, it leads to a whole lot of possible experiments that can be done. That's why the last slide I showed here was to emphasize that just one attosecond is over 3.5 million ticks. So the fact that when we watch the BMLS simulator run and we see the, uh, the ring buffer average of the uh, value for alpha, so drift up and drift down and drift up. The real question is, is that's almost no time at all compared to 3.5 million BMLS ticks, okay? So in other words, the fact that it's drifting up and down at first, also with the mass, the proton electron uh, mass ratio also drifts up, up and down, I found. In previous versions of the simulator, I tried to uh, program in a negative feedback where automatically the pro program would, if if alpha or, or the the uh, proton electron mass ratio was a little bit too high, uh, okay, we'll reduce the density a little bit, and if it's too low, this ne negative feedback will increase the density and just program that and just let the thing run so it'll home in on the density. That did not exactly work very well because over thousands of ticks, both of these parameters uh, tend to fluctuate up and down, which by the way, may be the mechanism behind all of the atomic clocks that we see, okay? They're shifting states from left, right, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to, to give us our atomic clocks. The fact that so, some of these important parameters are shifting around, um, within a range, you know, it'll go up and then it'll go down and you say, well, okay, it must be the middle of those ranges that I'm shooting for here. But the last point I'll say right, right now is this, it's very interesting that the measured proton electron mass ratio and alpha, as I've defined it today for the first time, uh, publicly uh, from BMLS lab, uh, that uh, are approximately the same bit densities. Who would have thought? That's well, consistent. Uh, the same bit density. I mean, that, that's what uh, I wanted to have some constraint on what you could set that bit density to, because otherwise uh, you could have you could have fit it to any value. But uh, well, if, when if you start the program, value, you, you can go out of whack, and you know, then you don't have that freedom. Right. Well, like, when you start the pro program. Uh, using the BMLS interface, the user-friendly thing that I showed you a week or so ago, or just the uh, hotspot.execute, you are allowed to enter the bit density. You 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 can enter 0 0.5, 0 0.6. P plasma starts at about 0 0.6, according to my work. <coughs> uh, an interesting experiment is that we can certainly perform experiments in plasma and uh, you could calculate what you think the alpha should be in a plasma environment, and then they should go measure it and see whether it's changed. Do we have some, uh, anybody, uh, I'm not even sure whether the alpha can be measured in a plasma well, environment. Well, you, you can measure alpha factor. with the BMLS Pro, Pro program. The question is, is whether physical uh, experimental techniques can be used to uh, you know, pl pl plasma, you know, they're, they're try trying to use plasma to create fusion and so forth, like the PPPL, that's three Ps, L, at Princeton, the uh, plasma something, I forget what, what it's called. They're, they're trying to set this up and they get getting all sorts of pro problems to keep the thing contained in a toroid and, and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so you can run the simulator at, at any bit density that you want. You know, just, well, just I'm, type thinking in that, value. I'm thinking that if this has to do with the spectra, then spectra typically are generated in a plasma environment. Although I'm not quite sure if that's the same plasma environment that 
that you're talking about that would have a bit density of 0.6. I mean, 0.6 is quite a bit different than 0.24. Um, yeah, well, it ranges up to 0.6 to about 0.75. But certainly if and that were When okay, you're above 0.75, you're in, you know, basically create a bomb to, to territory. Everything just explodes. You're creating a huge blast. But I'm just saying that if you could identify an environment which has that different bit density, and if they can perform this finding alpha in that environment, they should find it to be different, right? It should match the same kind of number that, you're, that uh, your simulation is producing. Well, applause to, to Franklin. What Franklin just said is the magic of science. I agree 100% and thank Franklin. This is the way any physical theory is tested. In other words, if you run the simulator at say uh, 0.65, right in the middle of the plasma range, let's say, uh, or 0.67 or so, something, you're right down there and, and uh, you'll have to download it again because I just uploaded this version last night. In the la latest version, it's gonna give you the alpha value, which, which is a running average. This is also included in the CVS uh, output file, which loads right right into Excel or any other spreadsheet program that you may like to, to use. <coughs> <coughs> so not only do you have the alpha values printed on the screen, you have a file that every single tick what the alpha value was, which can be plotted over time, can be averaged, or portions of it can, can be averaged. I found by run, running about 10,000 ticks, which, which takes a, a couple of hours on, on my little laptops here, <laughs> you know, uh, <clears throat> you probably have a better laptop than mine. Mine's just in the $200 range. Uh, at any rate, the, <clears throat> the, uh, 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 I can see that it takes thousands of ticks before things start to set, settle down. Uh, in other words, all of these quanta are slowly organizing themselves in the way that they're happy, and this is how the universe works. These are the time evolution laws and what you get from them. And what Franklin just said, I applaud again twice, because here you can use the simulator to get an alpha value in the plasma range. Then you can go to PPL and say, give me what your alpha measurement is in your plasma, if you can do it and see if Keen is right, or whether Keen is full of bull. Yeah, I'd have to look at uh, what, how are they actually measuring this thing? Because they call it a constant. So you'd think that if it was so sensitive to, I don't know, basically the density of space that they might have seen it not being so constant. This is one of those things that they, they like to measure to like uh, as many digits of precision as possible. I, I might just mention um, or read out what, what Eddington uh, said. Now, admittedly, this is a long time ago, and I think it's referred to in that Wikipedia article. You know, it's sort of the 1940s. But uh, he, he says there uh, that um, there has been much discussion whether the true value is 137.0 or 137.3. Uh, both values claim to be derived from observation. The latter, that's 137.3, called the spectroscopic value is preferred by many physicists. Now this is the, the important part. It is, however, misleading to call these determinations observational values, for the observations are only a substratum the spectroscopic value in particular is based on a rather complex theory and is certainly not to be treated as a hard fact of observation. Yeah, what are they measuring that's not a hard fact of observation? It's like, you know, there's this one constant in quantum mechanics that has been predicted out to like, you know, eight digits of precision. When you look at the actual experiment, it's just they're just measuring the wavelength, which is only known to like one digit of precision, right? In, in, is that something right. like that? Yeah, it seems to be something like that because he talks about um, measuring the momentum of a particle and 
you know, choosing the units and all that sort of thing. So it does it does depend on uh, on the theory that you're using. And he, he he relates, by the way. I mean, his favoring the one three seven value. It, he talks about one hundred and thirty seven degrees of freedom um, in in, in uh, the interaction of the particles here. What Ian just said uh, shows you just one 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 little step in the hundreds of different attempts by diff different very bright people to explain the uh, uh, alpha the value of alpha and <clears throat> who would have thought that it could be as simple as the little formula dividing the number of electromagnetic events from the uh, two electro EM bit operations by the uh, number of M type bits which are uh, subject to be affected by these events. Who would have thought that such a simple thing gives you alpha? By the but way, that alpha is very, very small, right? What? Like point, the alpha is very, very small, 0 0.007. So yes. to get that number, you'd have to have, you know, you number your bits. So you're saying it's the ratio of the number. Well, what did you, what's the nom, what's the, what's the numerator, what's the denominator there? Uh, so okay, the, the numerator are the, uh, the, uh, scalar, what I'm calling scalar and vector bit operation events. Uh, in other words, where there was uh, an electric potential or a magnetic potential, which resulted in moving a, a M-type bit uh, one length constant of distance. Okay, so, so this is the numerator is this value up here. Here's your V up here in the upper right. Can, can you see me wig wiggling the red cursor uh, light? It's V uh, and S. These two numbers add up to what I'm calling KE or kinetic energy or whatever you want to call it. It's just a sum of V and S. As you can see here, if you add up the V and the S, you get 27,444. That's your numerator. The denominator is the M, the number of M bits, the number of eligible bits in the volume which might be affected. In this case, we had 200, uh, 2,744 of 370,922 M bits. Okay? Of M type the I mean, just to paraphrase that, so of the available space, you know, only 0 0.007, you know, like percent, anything's actually moving in, right? Oh, only that proportion of the eligible M bits here, this 371,000 approximately M type bits, which have the charge attribute in binary mechanics, the L bits do not have a charge attribute. Uh, uh, how many of those were actually moved in this simulator tick? It was 2,744. So your numerator is 2,744. The denominator is the number of L eligible bits that could have moved had the uh, conditions been appropriate. And that's your alpha. Now, if you divide those numbers, you're going to get the actual value of alpha in this particular BMLS tick. This value down here in the red oval in the lower right is the running average of a ring buffer of those per tick values uh, of size 50. So your N here is 50 uh, measurements give you approximately this value. And <clears throat> what I was very disappointed at first, as I mentioned, was by running at hundreds and hundreds of ticks, I found that the value was drifting around. It would go above the 007 value and it would go below it and wander back up and back and forth and back and forth. And so, <clears throat> in other words, we're talking about a dynamic system that once, uh, just like our world, actually, you change one thing and a whole lot of other things uh, start to have to react to that and change 
also. And so you get this sort of an oscillation. And uh, I can just say, oh, my whole concept has failed because I can't zero in to an exact value, or it hasn't failed. That if I were to average this over a sufficient number of ticks, that's why I included this slide. Whoops. Last slide, view slideshow. <laughs> I've got to get back, but this slide. I say, well, gee, you know, how realistic is uh, my, uh, uh, you, you know, that in 10,000 BMLS ticks, I can get a really accurate value for, for, for alpha. And then I, I did this calculation to say, oh my God, just one out of second is 3.5 million ticks. I'm not even coming close to that, okay? Not even an itty bitty fraction. So that uh, what I've had to conclude though, is that the value of alpha will vary according to bit density, the overall quanta density in the simulated volume, which again, and it, you can control while it's running. You can hit the plus and minus keys. When it starts, you can type in a, any value you, you want. And uh, so uh, what I, I, I have to say is that if the approach I presented today makes any sense at all, it's basically saying that the bit density in the laboratories or the quantity density in the laboratories in which these measurements are, are made is approximately 0.24. That's what what it is. So if it goes elsewhere in the universe or on the top of a mountain or wherever, uh, where it's different, you'll get a different value for for alpha. That's what I'm, I'm saying. I'm just trying to uh, wrap my head around what this thing really means. And to me, it really means that uh, the that the percentage of activity in all of space is only 0.73%. So of all this, this is what I, this is what I'm getting. So in your model, out of all the available space, the only things which are actually actively working in the electromagnetic uh, way is only 0.73%. So that's uh, uh, a, a an accurate statement. Now, what what? Of, of course, I'm using the m bits. Whereas in the Feynman diagram shown in, in the Wikipedia article uh, that we've had up there on the fine structure constant, they're talking about electrons, okay, which prob, prob, probably are several m bits in one electron spot, the yellow colored area in the spot cube that I have shown. So <coughs> here we're talking about the ratio of the number of m bits in a volume and uh, which have the charge attribute, both plus and minus, by the way, and the um, uh, number of electromagnetic events that occur uh, and, and getting the, the va value of, of alpha. And it clearly depends upon bit density. If you double the bit density to 0.5 or half it to 0.12, you're going to get a different value for, for alpha. Now, my previous work on vacuum composition shows that if you start out, let's say with 0.9 bit density or 0.95 or something, you have an incredible explosion and the explosion is so violent, the blast is so uh, uh, intense that bits are blown out of the volume and you wind up uh, with uh, a whole volume of space with a lower bit density than, than normal, at least for a period of time. And this may be happening with, with supernova, where you have a huge explosion. And so vast regions of space might have, according to my work on vacuum composition, a much lower bit density. And so if, uh, if the astronomers have some way to measure alpha in those regions, they, they might find that it's different according to what my model would predict. <coughs> so that's the number of theory, that's Binary mechanics makes so many predictions, it's not funny. E everything you look at, there's specific predictions. And so far, e every single one of them has been proven correct according to data that have been looked at. Now, by bit density, you mean the number of your spot cubes, which have active moving bits in it. But space itself has a constant density, right? 
that space itself is would be well, space itself. Uh, uh, the 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 simulated volume here, of which only part is shown uh, uh, in in the display, because the dimension here is eighty, but we've only showing forty eight spots. You see, it goes down to full full forty eight here. <coughs> so the full well, volume is far 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 right. But uh, what heart, is in yeah. this space is nothing but quanta, one state bits. In a density, uh, as I'm showing here in the upper right with the red cursor, uh, 0.242 density. That's the only thing that's there, one state quanta. Uh, in other words, binary mechanics simplifies things. We don't have to ask, what is it made of? If it's anything at all, it's made of quanta, period. There isn't anything else to make anything of, okay? Only to only you what you want it, and you got two kinds, the M and the L. I'm trying to clarify. What do you mean by bit density? As far as I can tell, that would be, once again, a ratio, like 0.25 is 25% of the available, uh, you bit, know, spot two. Of the available bit loci. Yeah, You're exactly correct, Frank. Right? Available You're bit exactly loci, correct. you've got something moving in them, right? Is that what well, you mean by bit density? Well, if we stop time, the, uh, each qu quanta is in a particular bit locus. According to the postulates, a bit locus can only hold one quanta. You can try to figure out why that is. Who knows? You can imagine that a, qu a quanta is like, say, a basketball, and the size of the bit locus just holds a basketball. <laughs> and so you can only get one basketball in there. Uh, I don't know why, but the postulates of the theory say it's binary mechanics that only one quanta can occur in a bit locus. So when we talk about quanta density, we're talking about the number of quanta of both the M and the L type, which is the E value here. That's the for energy in the upper right. There's 743 some odd thousand quanta in this simulated volume. That number of quanta divided by the number of bit loci in the volume gives you your bit density. Now, if you want to really get weird, okay, if you really want to, this is, this is for the real abstract thinkers in the crowd, look at this model of space. There, it, What's here? It's nothing. You see where the red is in the electron ye colored ye yellow spot? Same way here, nothing. If we look on the inside, it's hollow. The other, an, a, In other words, we have a two by two by two structure here of which only six of the possible eight uh, uh, loci are used. So, <laughs> so you see, like if you want to do your calculations, Remember that the bit density is is a, a little bit under. Uh, 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 in other words, if, if you consider the overall volume, when we say the bit density of 0.24, in the overall volume, it it's it it's actually a little less than that because you've got these two empty cubes, which the theory does nothing to explain except that they're just empty. There's nothing there. You see, for each spot, if you look on the other side of the spot, there's another empty one. There's only six bit loci in this two by two by two volume. So that you have to correct by a factor of 75% uh, to, to, to get the quanta density per volume of space as measured in terms of our cubic meters, okay? <coughs> I'm sorry I threw that in. That may be a little I'm bit. I'm just wondering, does that mean that there's a limit to how high the bit density can actually be because you can't get to 100%? Yeah, well, yes, you can. 100%, that's it. No, 100%. No, 100%, that's it. Okay. That's maximum energy density, which is a brand new concept in physics. If you read any physics book, uh, the energy density could be, uh, remember the quanta represent energy uh, uh, in, in, in my work, uh, so that 100% uh, that's it. 
So this is your maximum energy density. Okay. You, you, you can't get any higher than that. And by the way, the Boltzmann constant, which tries to relate energy density to temperature, assumes it's linear. Well, it's not. I point this out in my article on, on CERN, and there's also a vi video on it, the, the pro problems of CERN, you know, saying that you've got so many millions of degrees, which is complete nonsense. Because it's assuming the Bolt Boltzmann constant relating temperature to energy density is linear. Well, there's a maximum energy density. So it couldn't be linear, could, could it? Now I see Alistair uh, comment. So I was wondering, Alistair, did you, did you want to ask some questions to James? I, I did actually. Um, James. Hello. Hi. So Hello, see, Alistair. What do you call your building blocks there? No, I want that screen back, Franklin, if I could. Yeah. What do you call those? Okay, uh, the uh, each uh, circle or, or triangle here is an M or L bit in a bit locus, okay? Okay. Two of these, they come in pairs with M and L, right. like uh, I'm showing here, the, I call that a spot unit. Three spot units arranged perpendicularly are a spot. Eight of those wait, wait, make up a spot two. What what was that last one? A spot? A spot, yeah, just, just a spot. A spot, okay. You know, like a place. You know, the right. meaning of the word spot as in a place. Okay. So eight spots make up the spot cube, is what you're saying? Yeah, there are eight spots. Uh, right. Okay, the electron and the positron shown in gray, which are the two lepton spots. And then you have six quark spots. <coughs> I know Frank Franklin doesn't like the word quark, and he's perfectly has every right to not like like it. Call them anything you want, but there's six I don't, I don't other care spots about labels or names. and there's three words. of these spots in the dark red, blue, and green are your matter quarks, or call them right. X, and okay. and the okay. light green, enough. blue, and red are your antimatter. Got it. Okay, got it. All right. So I this. Just because I wanted to mention something suggested, a, a path or an avenue you might want to look into, because I see a, a potential for a mathematical relationship there. You know, if you had, like, say, a dodecahedron, a 12-sided figure made with, five, with, with 12 pentagons, and let's say you inflated it till it became a sphere, okay, and then... You took that sphere and you deflated it, but instead of it becoming a dodecahedron, you turned it into an icosahedron. If the volume of the sphere made by inflating the two objects are the same, they're called like some kind of equivalency. I can't remember the exact term. So some geometries have certain equivalencies based on their volume to their face ratio. Are you following that? Sort of, but you've lost me in terms of the geometry there. I'd have to really go through it step by step. So you're ahead of me okay. on that. But keep 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 going, Al Alistair. Uh, all right. L let's let's just we're just <coughs> gonna just make sure that we got a couple of <coughs> basic concepts here. So uh, <coughs> just a basic cube. Okay. And then you blew a little bit of air in. Let's call it, pretend it's inflatable. And then you, you just blow a puff a little bit of air in so the sides all become convex. You can imagine that, right? So the sides all become all convex. Puff out a little. Like, like, like they're bulging out. Right. And, and then imagine. Why, why the would you do that? Pardon? Why would you do that? Well, just follow me for a minute, okay? Okay, it, it, all right. Just trying to set, set a foundation because I, there's something I want to relate. So okay. then imagine the opposite where you suck a little air out and now each of the six sides caves in a little bit. Okay. Okay, so you got that that puffing out and caving in. You understand what I'm saying when I say it. 
Yes. So now, imagine a more complicated geometrical shape, such as a dodecahedron, and doing the same thing, puffing in and watching those 12 panels puff out a little, or sucking in and watching those 12 panels collapse a little. Okay? Okay. So you've got that concept in your head of the framework stays there, but the panels puff in and out. All right. I, I, I'll accept that. Okay. Now the shape that I want to, to mention to, I, I'm guessing you've seen one before, but I, I just want to re-bring it to your attention is the cuboctahedron. Is Which it possible is, you could share us a picture of a yeah? You, you could Google search cuboctahedron. You'll you'll see a bajillion of them. How do you even spell that? C C U B O. If you put it in the chat now, unfortunately, I can't share my screen, but uh, maybe James can. Um. Well, whoever's got the screen control there would could just toss it up. Well, I'm I'm sharing my screen now. I'm showing the two views okay. of the can, spot cube. Can you bring up a what browser? is the what is the pay 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 dirt here? Uh, Why are we doing all this puffing and and sucking? A, a direct mathemat a suggested direct mathematical relationship to the pattern and ratios and quantities that you have on your screen. Fantastic. Perhaps. Write, write it up and present it. I'd love to see that. Perhaps. Fantastic. Or, or at least I'd like to offer you the possibility that you will see the relationship and that it will strengthen or benefit you in some way. Well, uh, please, please present that. Yeah. So, so maybe we could pull up a Kubak tahedron. Yeah, I can see it. It's like you take a hexagon and it, it goes up to a point to a triangle. And so that's a cuba octahedron thing. <laughs> if you can imagine. It would really help if we had one on the screen. Yeah, so uh, Alistair put like the spelling to it in the comments. So if you just go search for that, James, and show what it shows, and there'll be a picture. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I would like to see a presentation on that and uh, no, send it to me as a PDF or something. Okay, can Alistair? We just, can we not just Google a cuboctahedron? Yeah, he just wants you to go into Google and put in the word the cuboctahedron, and then a picture of it will show up, and we'll be, we'll be able to see it. It's just a geometrical shape. It's not like a physics thing. It's just a mathematical geometrical shape. Cuboctahedron. Yeah, if you just put that in any search, it'll 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 show what it is. C U B what? C U B oh. what? O O C T Kubok. Yeah, O C T, T A H Kubaktahedron. Got to get the A. Okay, hedron. H Y D R O N. No, H E instead of the Y. Although, if you search for that, I'm sure Google will fix it for you. Okay, let's search for it right now. Because Google's pretty dang smart that way. Okay, Wikipedia article show and then on the that images clicking on the Wikipedia article. No images, yeah, up in the top, there's a tabs there. Well, I already clicked on the 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 uh, well, let you show a picture of it anyway. You, so, you don't want the Wikipedia article, it'll Let's suffice. Have a look. Boy, that's taking a look. It's taking a long time to load because StreamYard is is you using a lot of the bandwidth here. Yeah. Oh, there we go. This, uh, there we go. Does that help you at all, uh, uh, Alistair? You know, let's. There it is. Click here for okay. rotating model. All right. See that? There it is. Now, 
Now, see, it is not a regular perfect polyhedron because all of its faces are not the same shape. It's a combination of squares and triangles. But it has a bunch of very right. um, unique uh, syn synchronicities. For example, look at the number of edges and the number of inter intersections and just in, in all kinds of ways, it's got like three faces that go through it at 60 degree angles that are hexa hexades he hex hexagonal. Sorry about that. So you can see how there would be one plane going up to the right, one plane going across with just a slight slope up to the left and another plane is harder to see it, it's kind of like if you took the page and pushed it in at the bottom left a little bit so you see the, the it has like three planes but they're not at 90 degree angles to each other they're at 60 degree angles at each other with each other and the, the, the triangle at the top and the triangle at the bottom point different directions. And this shape, volume to surface area ratio, is equal to the dodecahedron and the icosahedron, which are 12 and 20 sided shapes. And so all three of them if you were to turn all three of them into spheres, they would all be the same size sphere. So this particular shape, if you puff it and concave it, if you puff it, it becomes equal to those other geometrical figures when they're puffed. So I'm suggesting that the, the, the relationship between triangles, squares, and volume from this shape look like they may directly relate to what you were showing us with the block cube, which seems to be showing a ratio of squares and circles and triangles and volume. So that's why I wanted to show you this because I think that this will mathematically relate to the mathematics of your block cube. You Great. I, I would like to see that spelled out in a brief article. Oh, I, I don't have any article or anything like that. I thought it was like just something I'd just show you and you'd kind of understand what I'm saying, you know, because of the. Well, equipment. I understand that you're saying that this mathematical and ge geometric uh, manipulations may somehow be related to the binary mechanical model of space and or the primary constants proposed. And so uh, I would like to see how how that is done. And it's, it's not my job to do that. It's someone else's job who yeah, deals with no, I, I, I wasn't trying to get you to do nothing. I was offering you something. It's cool. Maybe you don't see it. I, and and I, that that's cool. Maybe it's a don't worry about it. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your input. Um, these things just need to be worked out in more, more detail. See, like I've been thinking about how, uh, you know, what ratio might represent alpha uh, with my, my model for some time and try different things. And so, uh, I, I got to where I got so far. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, and, and and mathematically, like quantitatively, and with your bit stepping, I think that you are headed down the right path mathematically, and I wish you well on that. And that's why I'm I'm introducing you to the the polyhedron because I think it directly relates to. See, if you were to ask me mathematically what the foundation of space looked like, 
I would say that it looked like two of these, one twelfth of the the volume apart. So if let's say the volume of that on the screen is, I don't care, call it say 144 is the volume, then if you were to take a second one of those and dotted line it over by one twelfth of the width and kind of leave it there as a dot, 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 second copy, that would be what I would suggest existence is made out of mathematically, which I think is what your diagram is showing without actually, like, I think that they're equivalent. Well, uh, it, 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 it'd be nice to see that shown. Because and you, and, you know and what math, you, you can prove they're equivalent or, or not. That's what mathematicians do. Yeah, a mathematician, I mean, I just see quantities and ratios and patterns and shit well. So, like I say, it, it was just something I was offering because I thought that you would be, I, I, I thought it might help you. Well, I see Bob Gray. Uh, so, James, if you go into the Thank comments, you. if you click on comments, Bob Gray has uh, put a link there. And that discusses like... Okay, sh 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 should I take my... Should, should I stop sharing the screen so I can look at no, the com comments or, or what? Well, you can keep sharing the screen, I think. Um, but just go back to um, StreamYard. And there's... Oh, yeah. In StreamYard, I, I see uh, uh, Dennis Allen has a comment. Keep going, uh, Frank Franklin. I'm sorry. I, I see that I can go back to uh, StreamYard. <laughs> yeah. Bob, Bob has put a link there. I think if you can copy that link and then paste it into your browser, we can see this paper, which kind of relates to the possible shapes that a space filling object could have. If I can make some comments here. Oh, okay. Um, can, I have. Can people hear me? I've copied the link. Right. Now you want me to uh, copy that and then paste I'm that. I'm putting into your Bob's browser. link into. Control V, enter. Okay, it says Bob Gray Projects, com, Jitterbug Defined Polyhedra, The Shape and Dynamics of Space by Bob Gray. Yeah, I've done a lot of work with uh, polyhedra. Can everybody see that? Yeah, we can see it. And uh, with the cube octahedron and a lot of different... Uh, geometric shapes and so forth. And if people are interested at some point, I could go through a presentation on that part of my research. But I had hoped to get in touch with James at some point when I was finishing up other work and could focus on his binary mechanics a little bit more and look at the, um, the bit operations that he has to see if they correspond to some of the dynamics that I found in the various polyhedra. In particular, this cube octahedron, which um, R. Buckminster Fuller calls the vector equilibrium, it can transform into all of the platonic solids or all of the platonic polyhedra shapes. It seems to be a very fundamental shape and dynamic of space. So when James starts talking about, you know, he has this like a cubic lattice and there's bit operations and a bit goes from here to here and over to there and, and so forth. I'm wondering if there's a relation between those kind of shifting along the lattice and the dynamics that um, Bucky Fuller and myself have explored with this cube octahedron. Um, these are just rotations at now the moment our... that's shown, but uh, on other pages, it will go through the cube octahedron motions and how they relate to all of the uh, the basic platonic solids. But Bob, I... can 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 I say something to to uh, to, to to Bob? Yeah, go. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm lo I'm lo looking at your cube here. Apparently, you have the CAD programs to be able to punch in the, the coordinates of the proton bit cycle shown in my article, um, among other places, 
uh, on inertial propulsion mechanism. I would love to see the CAD to see that rotating. Now, in, interestingly enough, the translation motion is a solid diagonal of the spot cube, not uh, as you have it sp spinning around uh, uh, the axis that you show here uh, in, 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 in your video. I would love to see that, uh, or um, if you could share with me what the software is that I might use to, to so that I, I could punch in the, the coordinate values in, in the proton bit cycles to see it rotate like this so that we could rotate it one way or the other and, and to see what the, the proton shape actually looks like. Uh, my recommendation at the moment would be probably um, a, a JavaScript package uh, which can do 3D animation things. Um, what I'm showing on this web page is a Java 3D program, which I wrote specifically for this. Um, but the technology's moved since I originally did these. And now you can put up a web page pretty simply with 3D geometric shapes. And I'd be happy to uh, help you do that, or you could help me do that. Um, I don't understand your work well enough to do that on my own. But uh, well, if you it, want to talk it, offline, you know, um, send me an email uh, with a specific link. I didn't catch the early part of, of this session, so I don't have the links of exactly what you talked about today. Um, and then depending on my time, yeah, we could hammer something out, you know, to, to get the animations fantastic. and interactions you want. You, you uh, talked uh, about love that. punching in a lot of coordinates or some coordinates. Um, that's fine if those coordinates somehow define a polyhedron of some shape. Um, I don't know what you mean well, by well, you know, putting they, in coordinates. They, they define an object. They, they just define an object. Now, I know that I, I could create a matrix of these coordinates and multiply uh, by the appropriate sign and cosine values to, to rotate it and project it into a 2D plane, you know, to, to view it that I, I could write such a pro program. But, um, you know, like if, if, if somebody just has it all re ready to go, you know, just punch the val values in, I, I would really appreciate that. What's the numbers? Uh, what's the number of uh, vertices that have to be typed in? Is it Lots well, 42. 42, well, 42. That's, yeah, that's that's not very much. That'd be simple to do. Yeah, and 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 they're connected with with uh, lines, with, yeah, yeah. which which, which uh, uh, give you uh, the direction, so to speak, that the qu quantum would flow in the proton bit cycle, and it'd just be nice to see it rotate around. Sure. And like like the circles that you show here. Uh, yeah. On the vertices of your cube that I'm uh, highlighted with my red cursor here, All right on the screen, uh, those circles could perhaps be made big enough to be the size of one bit locus. So it's going to look like more like a ball, a structure of balls, and 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 you rotate it around, and and you see what a proton actually looks like. Sure, let's take because, it off. Because see my graphics. Oh, okay, fantastic. I bookmarked your uh, RW Gray proje pro projects com, and presumably there's a, a web, yeah. uh, an email address there I, I could write if you. you. Yeah, if you scroll down, um, there's a lot of other, and I, it may even be on the next page of this that shows some of the dynamics. But anyway, we can discuss it offline. Absolutely. James, I'm James uh, J. Keen at, at, at Gmail. Yep. So James, I had another suggestion. Thank you, Bob. Sure. I had another suggestion for you for modeling software. It's the one that I use. Uh, now, since your uh, model is like this block-like thing, uh, you might uh, want to check out the uh, Lego Digital Designer. So this allows you to basically form up any geometric shape that you could build out of Lego blocks. And then once you do that, you can spin it around and 
and rotate it. Uh, you know, just oh, fantastic, Franklin. Fantastic. That's what that I use to uh, image, say, my cubic model because it's basically made out of blocks, just like your spot cube is made out of blocks. And all you have to do is right. just, it, just like you're a child, you just add the blocks in space anywhere you want, any different color you like. And then when you're done, then you can do stuff like this. You can rotate it. You can just arbitrarily look at angles and things like that. So you might want to check that out. I'm not sure. I, you I, thank you, Franklin. I, I, I jotted down Lego Digital Designer. I'll look that up, sir. Yeah, look that up. So that stuff doesn't require any programming. You just place the blocks where you want them. And you could do that just like you have in the same colors uh, that you have in your diagram. And then you can just, you know, look at it any which angle. So try that out. That might be fun for you. That'd be very quick to to uh, set up the model that way. Oh, that that would make a great video. Yeah, it would make a great video. I've got I make videos. Uh, I have my uh, if I could share my screen, I could show you my video on the cubic atomic model that uses that the digital designer software. And uh, I, I can really, and you could probably go see it, but uh, just so you can see how that works. Um, well, if you type in the link, I, I, I could bring 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 it up. Okay, let me see if I can just find like I did with Bob shows, Ray. Uh, how that how that works. Oh, I, think I, I see really that you cool. typed in the Lego di digital designer. Let me uh huh. Yeah, you can go to that link and you can is check that what out you wanted? What, what is there. You can download well, one thing that. I don't like about this. Should I stop sharing my screen now? Uh, you can keep showing your screen if you like. Um, but let me see here. Let me put in this link here so you can see what this thing actually looks like. Let's see here. Blah blah blah. Okay. So I'm gonna. I, so I just put in a YouTube link. So if you can put that into your browser and play it, then you can kind of see what the environment looks like. It might be what what you need. It worked perfectly to uh, image uh, my cubic atomic model. That's why my my atomic model is like the playing with kids' toys because it's uh, it, it's literally like Lego bricks. So that that would just uh, have you seen that? Do you see that link down there to YouTube? Yeah, I just uh, click clicked on it now. It's loading right. now. See whether it'll go there. Might take a while because things are, of course, are slow. But let's see if it comes up. Let's give it a little longer. It's trying here. to come up now, as you can. There we go. There you go. Let's see what it does. Six minutes. It's. It's competing with the stream live uh, bandwidth, of course. Yeah, it's struggling. It's competing I, I severely. Uh, stream yard. You can almost hear the, the punches in the. Uh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. I hope stream yard fixes the, my ability to share. That's really. Yeah, because uh, I, I've got DSL here. It's all over a phone line. It, it, generally, it's. Now, what browser are you using? Are you using Chrome? James, what browser are you using? I think it took up way too much bandwidth, I think. So. That doesn't seem to be working. So, Ian, you're still there, right? Yeah. Well, I, I got it up a moment ago. Um, so, Ian, yeah, you're still there, right? Yeah, everything yeah, kind of up for a moment there. So maybe we can't show. Well, I got it up a moment ago. Um, so, Ian, yeah, you're still there, right? Yeah, everything yeah, kind of up for a moment there. So maybe we can't show. Well, I got it up a moment ago. Um, so, Ian, yeah, you're still there, right? Now well, we're getting some weird echoes. <laughs> Okay, let's let's see here. Uh, 
Uh, well, James, I think you're going to have to just check that out on your own because it looks like uh, that's too much for Stream StreamYard. Can you still hear me, James? I think maybe his uh, connection is uh, not working because it's just too much. Yeah, I think uh, James's picture has been frozen there. So, Ian, uh, what do you, what do you think of all this? You have to unmute yourself there. Has James found the secret to the fine structure constant? Yeah. Uh, what do what do you think of all this? You have to unmute yourself there. I, I'm a little frightened to say anything the because um, we're getting repetitions, uh, Franklin. Yeah, we are getting a bad echo out of your. Uh, We're getting repetitions, Franklin. Yeah, we are getting a bad echo out of your your uh, transmission there. I wonder why that is. Um, you might have to, I don't know, uh, type in the chat to let me know what your responses are. But I'd be curious to know, you know, is this convincing to you? I mean, it looks. It looks uh, very interesting in that he's coming up with the right number and he doesn't seem to be cooking the books that much. I mean, his, uh, you know, the initial, it does depend upon his initial bit density, but, uh, you know, out of, out of, out of the gate with the, the initial, you know, 0.25, uh, it doesn't seem like he's cheating in that way. It's not like he's tuning the bit density to exactly get the fine structure constant. Okay, let's see. I think we have James back. Okay, here we go. I think we got you back, James. Or maybe not. There you go. Yeah, yeah I, some I, somehow I... I, <coughs> I lost the connection there. Sorry. Yeah, I think uh, putting YouTube over StreamYard was just too much for it. But uh, you can check that out uh, later on your own. But I yeah, think I was actually listening to that okay, uh, thank Streamyard you. and it, sorry that YouTube and it was conflicting with the Streamyard, so I, I apologize for that. But um, we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I think it was my system was interfering. I'm sorry. I thought it was you. Um, but um, if, if you'll forgive me, um, being a bit little frank here, I, I'm always a little skeptical of these sort of. Um, systems these sort of platonic idealistic systems which try to um you know formulate what what actually is happening in the real world uh you know fr frequently we, we can let our minds um overtake uh, reality to some extent we can sort of say well i think it must be beautiful and i think it must be this and i think it must be that i think to a certain extent this is what 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 has been done in in modern physics but you know, to a certain extent, we may be harping back on sort of idealistic systems. Um, you, you know, before um, Kepler uh, established uh, using, uh, I suppose, um, uh, the the the, the uh, you know the, the Danish um, astronomers' data to get the elliptical orbits of the planets, he was looking at all these various Platonic uh, figures and, and and seeing w what would be more beautiful and, and so on and so forth. And I'm not sure if it got him, uh, Tycho Brahe, the, the Danish astronomer. So we have to be very, very skeptical of, about things like that. I'm, I'm sorry, um, but, but um, I, I, I have an open mind on it, but I, I, I'm always uh, concerned about jumping to conclusions based on idealisms of the mind or thinking what the, the earth should be or what the universe should be. Well, how exactly does that relate to this discussion here? So uh, James has presented a particular, I guess, mathematically computable model. So are you just suspicious of those kind oh, of mathematical okay. models? I suppose I was talking a bit more about the more recent uh, expositions on the polyhedra and all that. Uh, yeah, but J James is... Um, I mean, you know, all, all these simulations are are are, are of interest, uh, you know, as an exercise. Um, but um, you know, w w when you start applying all these binary mechanics things to to inertial propulsion systems and gyroscopes and all that, you, you know, there may be something in it. But for my part, I, I think these things can be explained essentially by 
Newtonian macro dynamics or a slight modification, if you like, a neo-Newtonian system. And, and by the way, I'm going back a little now to something we discussed some weeks ago, but uh, Eric uh, Lathwaite himself, I understand, did later on concede that his um, experiments did not essentially contradict New Newtonian macroscopic uh, physics. So, um, you know, if, if that is so, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure, you know, if, if the necessity of some of these very detailed simulations uh, are they, as James, you know, James says, well, you know, they 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 bring us um, uh, to um, a, a data which are totally consonant with what we experience experimentally. You know, they're they're not contradictory. But are are they telling us any any anything more? I mean, um, it, to me, it's almost philosophy. You can start arguing philosophically what is the essential structure of 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 matter how 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 the world works and um, and we talked about that when we were talking about the ether or um or the quantum foam or the uh, you sound like a politician ian <laughs> you, you, you think i'm not i'm not being hard enough franklin you no, think I, I don't think so i mean uh, <laughs> uh you know james's claim is that you know this is the true and correct structure of space that these spot cubes really do exist. And his evidence is that, you know, when he kind of just randomly read the uh, definition of what the fine structure constant is, which is this ratio of active to inactive, you know, he just stuck that in his model, ran it, and then lo and behold, this same number comes up. I mean, pretty close, right? It's so. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I'm delighted to hear it. And it, it almost, if I may be a bit unpolitical now, it, it, it sounds too good to be true. You know, J James says that that um, this is a wonderful tool that that um, can explain anything, really, and, and so far has been totally successful. Well, if, if that's so, um, you know, great. But I, I, I must withhold my um, judgment and even belief in the necessity uh, you know, for these microscopic analyses in, in many respects, which I think can be established in, in other ways. So the, the bottom line is you don't believe James. <laughs> well, I don't know what you're talking about now. We, we were talking about the, the, the geometrical shapes, and now I was going into uh, maybe using binary mechanics for uh, uh, the necessity of it for explanation of um, inertial uh, propulsion. Well, in regard to that, uh, it's not so much that I don't believe James, but I'm not convinced that we cannot uh, explain, you know, these phenomena on neo-Newtonian principles or Newtonian principles. And therefore, I'm not sure about the necessity for, for, the, for this analysis. You know, maybe it's complementary. Uh, maybe it's unnecessary. May maybe it adds some further insight. But I I'm not convinced of that at, at this stage. I I'm well, trying to withhold my judgment, yes. Well, by, by Newtonian, do you mean, like, like for me, you know, I like things that can be demonstrated with Newtonian mechanics on billiard tables, right? Basically, um, I don't believe it unless you can show it to me how that works in a billiard table. And I guess that would kind of be the basis of, of, uh, of my doubts or problems with uh, mathematical uh, simulations like James has. I mean, is, is, is your objection similar to that? Do you like to see something more physical or...? Well, uh, you, you, you're even more opposed to it in a way than I am because you 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 need this physical uh, tabletop demonstration. Well, I, I need either that or a mathematical demonstration would be sufficient for me if it's based on uh, well-established um, principles like 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 Newtonian principles. Um, I I I I I. I I'm yet to be convinced that you know we we have a new system for analysis of fundamental uh, structural elements of the universe, you know, w w which which is useful. I mean, if, if that is so, well, go ahead. You know, one has my blessing if it's of any use. Go ahead and and and, and do some experiments and and perform some analyses uh, and and indicate some results which cannot be 
ostensibly um, obtained in other ways and publish that. And, you know, I, I'd give it all my support and I would think ultimately it would come into the um, mainstream physics. But, you know, I don't see any evidence of that at present. Evidence of what? Uh, exactly? uh, well, well, I, I, uh, I, I don't I, know whether... Uh, Go ahead, James. I, yeah, uh, I don't know whether Dr. Allen is still with us, but uh, he is. I, I got tipped off by a book written by Dennis Allen, Jr., uh, <clears throat> where... Uh, in contrast to what Ian was saying uh, about Newtonian mechanics, Dr. Allen was uh, suggesting that uh, <clears throat> Newtonian mechanics are not followed by inertial propulsion uh, effects because we have lack of separate conservation of angular momentum and linear momentum. Instead, in, uh, lath uh, in, in the uh, uh, inertial propulsion gyroscopic effects, uh, we have a conversion from some uh, amount of angular momentum into linear momentum. And if, if uh, Alan uh, can probably uh, say this better than, than me, because he, he wrote the book and I, and I, I read his book. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if he's there, James, but he was so kind as to send me a, a copy of, of the two volumes of that Neo-Newtonian uh, book that, that, that he wrote. And I, I've, I've, I've read it as well. I've read the two volumes. Um, and I, I, I do take what you say. But on the other hand, um, he, he called it Neo-Newtonian um, analysis or something like that. But I didn't see a major departure from the Newtonian way of looking at things um, you know I, I i saw some modifications or some amendments but i did i didn't say anything contradictory um you know you've you've mentioned one thing about the okay momentum. well the book i'm referring the, the the book i'm referring to sir is is the book i'm referring to sir is is the one uh, let's see i think it's called foundations of uh uh gut gucci gucci's uh, mechanics. Uh, Gucci was apparently uh, a, a German uh, physicist or mathematician that uh, was trying to uh, come to grips with uh, the lack of separate conservation of angular and linear momentum. And, in the, and, and that's the book specifically that I was referring to. So oh, okay. that so apparently... Uh -huh. No, oh, no, just to say that uh, it's probably a different book. Uh, my book, uh, the books I refer to were Neo-Newtonian Mechanics. Now, he does refer to, to that, the Gutzian um, Mechanics, in an appendix, but it's the, there isn't a whole book on it. So I think we are referring to a different different series of books. But it, 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 it might not be very far de uh, departed from it. Hmm. Well, anyway, my, uh, my point is there at present. So we've got some comments here um, from uh, YouTube here. So Musari says, for me, Jane's model is math derivatives, is it not? So it can explain some aspects that have been not, have not been derived yet, but sure it always has to work out correctly backwards for any number constant. I'm not exactly sure I understand that comment there. What do you make of that, James? Well, the, the word constant uh, is used in physics textbooks like Appendix A is usually your so-called list of physical constants, Planck's constant, speed of light, electric charge, etc. cetera. Um, but, but this is a, a propaganda effort to make it look like these values are somehow enshrined separate and in part and, uh, and used in the rest of physics. I'm claiming that that's propaganda. They're not constants, uh, our primary or so-called quote unquote fundamental constants because they can be derived from what I'm calling the primary constants. 
And uh, my, my work in binary mechanics comes from the Dirac equation, basically, the relativistic Dirac equation, which has been very successful in predicting electron behavior. Um, uh, a pair of opposite handedness of these two uh, of these equations, two, two of them of opposite hand handedness was used to postulate the presence of the positron, for example. Um, so uh, as far as the math background on it, what I did was quantize everything in sight. So we're going from continuous space-time math, you know, the calculus as it were, uh, to basically binary math, which involves and and not logic. And, and it's a lot simpler. You know, like share, I share with e Ian this a uh, uh, little bit of skepticism about these polyhedrons and cuba hecta, whatever it is, because everything in binary mechanics is to make things simple. The universe is not um, uh, a, a, an infinite number of supercomputers to compute values of electric and magnetic fields and so, so forth, which are all infinitely small at every spot or point in space, which is what continuous space-time theory asserts. And it's like a fantasy world, okay? So in binary mechanics, the one rule is make everything as simple as possible. Uh, we don't need, uh, if, if you've seen some of these mega computers and supercomputers, they take up whole rooms. And yet the physicists stand there and tell us that there's actually an infinite number of these and they're infinitely small at every point in space to do all the calculations necessary to get the electric and magnetic field potentials um, at that particular point. Well, uh, how in the world could anyone make such a universe? My approach is to say, let's make everything as simple as possible. Uh, the, the, we don't add any complexity unless it's absolutely necessary to add it. And so uh, that is the uh, idea of full quantization. Once you decide that energy, in terms of the quanta, one or zero values, they could have five values. Why not 10 values, possible values? In binary mechanics, there's only two values, one or zero. And, uh, and quantizing length, which gives you your bit loci cubes, and quantizing time. Uh, when you quant do that, what I call full quantization, there are certain consequences. And everything that I've written and, it's, and spoken about simply a consequence of that step. Once you make that step, you know, certain things work and certain things don't work. But at least you're not in a fantasy world. You're in, in a world where, hey, you can imagine, I got spot units and spot cubes, and those are repeated throughout the entire universe in a span to latest. Well, 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 that's something that's sort of doable compared to there's an infinite number of supercomputers and they don't take up a whole room full of big boxes and a whole bunch of kilowatts of power to run. They're all infinitely small. This is a story uh, without full quantization in terms of quantum theory and physical theory. And so I, th I think this whole thing of calling speed of light a fundamental constant is nothing more than pro propaganda. There's Dennis Allen. He, he can explain all this better than me, I, I'm sure. Yeah, in terms Dennis, of the Newtonian uh, Do you want to comment? Dennis, you want to unmute yourself? And uh, we're, we're getting towards the end here. I'm glad we to give you the last comment here. Uh, Lucian Mechanics has a different second and third law of motion. Uh, in order to get to the point where momentum is not conserved in an isolated system, but you can turn angular momentum into linear momentum. And the second law is uh, based on energy. I have it in the book uh, in the uh, second chapter, I think it is. And the third law is uh, also uh, a variation, an energy variation of Newton's third law. Uh, now, when I wrote Newtonian Mechanics, 
I assumed that Newton was basically right, except that uh, for certain high accelerations that were very nonlinear, there are, uh, adjust, you have to adjust uh, for that uh, to get the right answer in a, to a very high accuracy. But then I found out that uh, there was such a thing as inertial propulsion, and so I had to look into people who were, had a theory of it, and the only one who had a theory of it that made any sense, it wasn't just cherry-picking Newton's mechanics to get the right answer, was Gushkin mechanics. And he has a book, let me see if I can get it here. Here's a book that I wrote about Nurse propulsion, you thought it's impossible. Godfrey Gushki. So, uh, I analyzed his mechanics, uh, which is, uh, he's not a mathematician and he's not a logician. He's an electrical engineer. So I, I analyzed it and uh, I wrote this book and then I wrote two appendices, Appendix 1 and Appendix 2. For it. And the book is published, but without the appendices, because uh, I, I used to go to the library and uh, type up my stuff. I don't have Microsoft Word on my computer, which is very slow and has a small memory. And so I haven't been able to get around to uh, incorporating it into my book in a newer edition. But... Uh, it, I view the whole thing of mechanics is in the following terms. Uh, it's like a vibration problem where you have two or three or four modes of vibration, some uh, longitudinal, some uh, sideways, and so on. Uh, you break the problem down into all these various modes, study each mode independently, and then try to fit their, their answers you get doing each one independently together to make a, a solution that fits the whole problem. And so uh, I see someday, uh, hopefully, I'll be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, incorporate both Gushki mechanics and Nina Tony mechanics into a theory uh, which uh, uh, takes both into account correctly. Okay, let's see here. So we had some comments uh, going on here. We're getting close to our time here. Uh, someone wants to buy that book. Maybe you can get it on Amazon or something. Yeah, Joseph, he wants that book, right? Yeah. Well, you can download it for free uh, in, in the appendices, too, on either academia.edu or researchgate.com. Or you can order the book from Amazon, but the two appendices are not in there yet. Okay, so ResearchGate, so you should be able to type in uh, that name. ResearchGate, R-E-S-E-A-R-C-H-G-A-T-E dot com. And uh, they'll, they'll ask you uh, if, if you're a member, you say no if you're not. And uh, then if you send them a paper you published on just about anything, in 24 hours, they'll give you OK to enter in, and you can choose your password and go. Academia.edu is they want 100 bucks, and then they'll give you your password and go. OK. Let's see here. I think Alistair, he also shared uh, a comment here, another link here. I think we'll have time to actually uh, look at that. But, uh, but Alistair says that uh, he has something which is very similar. Uh, it's very similar to, to like uh, Legos and it's very similar to James Bitblock. So there's something interesting we can see there. And uh, I did want to, before we end here, share the links that were, that were mentioned in, during this presentation here. Let's see here, I think I've got those here. So let's see here. Um, so to Bob's paper, um, that would be this link here. So that's about his uh, 
discussion of geometrical shapes and space. Now, from what little of reading I did there, you know, he noted like certain shapes can fill the entire space. And the cube is like one of those shapes that can completely 100% fill the space, but things like uh, octahedra or whatever can't be made to spend to fill the entire space. So I noticed that that, that James, you know, spot cube, you know, is a cube. So potentially it could, you know, fill all of space as one comment. Uh, and anyone's interested in playing with Lego digitally, uh, this is the link to the Lego digital designer. And that's good for modeling anything physically, whatever you happen to be trying to, to build up there. Um, and this is a link to my video, which uses the Lego digital designer to model, you know, anything you would like in terms of uh, anything that you could geometrically build up any shape in uh, a model there. And uh, let's see here, any other links? Uh, and uh, finally, there's the, the link here that Alistair had, which I'll have to check out later. Um, so, but I think that'll do it for uh, this episode of the, of the science chat. Uh, we started out with a presentation by James Keene about what the fine structure constant is and how he managed to find that fine structure constant, which appears to be actually a percentage and uh, of, of the chance of a electromagnetic interaction happening, which apparently is very small, only 0.73% chance that an electromagnetic interaction will happen. So he just plugged that into his system, uh, output this ratio of what it is in his system, and lo and behold, came up with the same number. So that that is evidence that uh, his model is basically <sighs> predicting uh, a value which had previously been a mysterious constant that no one knows where it came from, but apparently that 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 ratio can be observed in his simulation. So I'm I'm thinking that you know I'm still not too crazy about the whole M and L bit thing, but I I, I do like uh, the idea that things are quantized. You know, particularly I agree that there is a a, a small bit of time and a small bit of length, certainly. I'm not sure there's a smallest bit of mass, but you know, uh, James has shown that just using, starting with those constant mathematically, you can build formulas to get the, you know, uh, other constants. But although this would be a case where you, where you kind of get the fine structure constant as a result of running his simulation. So it's not something that you could theoretically, mathematically put together, although, the fine structure constant is appears to be the reason that can be can be expressed as all these other constants as well. So I'm thinking to a certain extent, uh, to a certain extent, it, it may be that it's more more what's more important is the is the actual mathematical relationships that once you start with a good base like uh, quantization of space and time. You pick the right numbers and make all the numbers fit that uh, at that point, maybe the geometrical model, maybe not that important or, or maybe it is, but you know, still it's remarkable that uh, we've been discussing that that number just kind of falls out, out, out of his mathematical model. And you can just, you know, you can see it's, it's, it's the same as the, the accepted amount. Okay, so, but uh, thank you, James, for bringing that up. Yeah, so this this could be a, uh, you know, maybe an answer to, you know, what is this magic number, the fine structure constant. So, and, uh, but that will do it uh, for uh, this episode of the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Science Chat, and hope to see you here next week. So, bye, everyone.